Hello, my name is Eileen Glover. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Koala. And I want to talk today, actually a really good continuation of that great panel that we just had, um, about some of the missing pieces. The distributed exchanges are a big missing piece of infrastructure that we have today in the industry. And I want to talk about some more really, really important pieces of cryptocurrency infrastructure that we need to build in order to take the industry to the next level. Our company has been around for a little bit over two years now, and we have been focused since the very beginning on really um, triggering and uh, doing the things to remove the obstacles to mass adoption of cryptocurrency. So that means, you know, bringing everyone else in the world into this industry so that we can expand beyond where we are today. And I want to talk a little bit about a couple of key components of that. One is stable coins. And the other is uh, a little bit of uh, talking about the speed of networks. Um, we are about 20 people to date, um, and 12 of those are, are devs who are spread around the world. Most of, most of them are based in the UK and in, and, and Europe. Um, and we have been working uh, very quietly, I guess, for a little bit over a year on something that we think is very exciting for all of you. So before diving into that, I want to talk a little bit about where we are today. I, I really like to look at where crypto is compared to the rest of the asset classes that we have in the world, just to remind ourselves that we're basically nothing. That little speck there inside that circle is the market cap for all, for all crypto assets. And then we have all of these very, very big types of asset classes out there in the world. I think that we're all here because we realize that the tokenization of these other asset classes has already begun and that it's going to expand dramatically into these other fields over the coming period of time. There's a famous book called The Innovator's Dilemma by Jeffrey Moore, and he talks about adoption cycles for new technologies. Um, you know, we're small and tiny, a little speck like that, because we're at this very first stage still in the token economy. We're still just rooms full of innovators, and our products have not really gone mainstream yet. So what we want to do over this next period of time is figure out how do we leap over this chasm and start getting into the mainstream society when our, our relatives uh, who wonder what we're doing in this space in the first place, when are they going to start using cryptocurrency, let's say, for everyday transactions? You know, when are merchants going to begin to accept this? When will we all have crypto wallets on our phone and have this integrated into a part of our daily lives? And so we think there are, you know, some pieces missing. Again, I, as I said earlier, the biggest pieces that we've been focusing on as a project are really stablecoin and also faster networks that can handle more enterprise-grade transaction throughput. Um, in the stablecoin space, you know, even up in the speaker's lounge before coming down today, I had lots of questions from very, very smart people about how does our project, our stablecoin is called KUSD, and our company is called Koala, how does that relate to some of the others that we're all familiar with? Um, the panelists a moment ago were talking about the need for stable coins to facilitate distributed exchanges, and they also talked about some of the concerns with one stable coin that's dominant today called Tether. And so I want to talk a little bit to help sort of understand these different approaches to stable coins and what the opportunities are for all of us coming up over this next period of time because there's some developments in this technology that you all need to know about. So one way to group stablecoin approaches is by how they actually achieve stability, right? Um, understanding a stablecoin, you know, something that relatively has the same buying power tomorrow that it has today, uh, unlike the other crypto assets that we uh, know and love, which might drop or rise by 30% 30, 30 from one day to the next. In order to make this very, very useful, we need something that's more akin to a, to a fiat currency. So here on this, um, on this chart, you see some, some different approaches. I'm going to talk about these. I mentioned first Tether, um, which is the dominant stablecoin to date. Tether is a certain type of stablecoin. It is a fiat-backed stablecoin. You can think of that almost like a casino chip or an IOU. If you go to the casino, you give the teller a dollar, they give you a 
casino chip. You can take it out and uh, gamble with it. Hopefully you return with it or with more. And then you give it back to them, they give you back your money. That's the way that Tether is supposed to work. And that's the way that these fiat-backed cryptocurrencies are supposed to work. Um, you know, there are, there are some advantages to that that I want to talk about in a moment, but there are also some very, very big drawbacks. So Tether, as uh, some of the panelists mentioned a moment ago, has had some uh, difficulties with confidence. Um, and this, we can say, uh, is, is in part, in large part, a function of, this, of the centralization that is required if you have an asset-backed token, especially a fiat-backed token. Uh, but there's some other concerns as well. So these others here in this column are also asset-backed, uh, excuse me, fiat-backed um, stable coins. And um, they have sort of their limits. I'll get into that in a moment. Then you have other types of asset-backed coins, coins that are backed by crypto, right? So um, MakerDAO has a coin called the DAI that many of you are probably familiar with. The way that that one works is kind of the same as the way I described Tether. You take some Ether, you put it into a contract, out the other side comes, you know, 75% of the value of that roughly comes out in this stable coin called DAI. Now, if your Ether declines as it has in the last few weeks, that contract then might be liquidated automatically and you might lose your Ether. So this is a step beyond, we think, the simple fiat-backed approach. Um, but it also has its drawbacks. BitShares and a new project called Haven are also kind of of the same ilk. They've got the same kind of approach. Now, on the right side of the screen, you see where it says non-asset backed. And um, I think to a lot of people, that sounds kind of scary at first. You know, you say, well, you're going to give me a cryptocurrency. I want to use that as a stable coin for payments out there in the real world and yet you're telling me that it's not backed by any assets. That doesn't sound very secure. Uh, but I like to remind people that Bitcoin and Ether and Litecoin and others are also not asset backed, right? So they achieve their value and their utility not by having gold in a vault or dollars in a vault or what have you, but rather by using mathematics and the market forces. Okay, so these, this new class of stablecoin uses those things as well. You've got to use mathematics and market forces to achieve stability. So there are a couple of main different types of approaches in this non-asset-backed class. Um, Seniority shares is one that you may have read about. This approach um, relies on market forces especially on incentivizing certain actors in the marketplace to control the money supply. So you can think of it like a treasury, for example, or maybe like a bond. The money supply sometimes needs to decline if you want to control the price and bring it back in line with a dollar. So that's kind of hard to do, right? To, to cause the money supply to, to lower automatically. So the way senior shares work is they, they say, uh, excuse me, sir, if you would please buy a lot of these tokens right now and sort of lock them away in something akin to a time deposit, we're going to pay you back your principal, and then we're also going to pay you some interest over time. So we just need you to pull those out of the marketplace for us right now, and we're going to pay you back, and you're going to make a profit on that. Okay? So that this is something that the Federal Reserve does. Um, and so it's pretty nifty. It's, it, it's kind of cool because now you can have this decentralized network and you have an incentive um, to remove money from the money supply. Adding it, of course, we all know is very, very simple, right? It's not hard to add money to the money supply. Um, but that also has some drawbacks I'm going to talk about in a moment ago. Um, New Bits, the one down there at the bottom I might mention, is currently trading at 33 cents per token. So. Um, that's a problem, right? Uh, and so I'll, I'll mention in a little bit why, how that can happen with the senior shares model. Uh, finally, there's uh, a, a new category, and that's the category that, that our project is in. Um, we call that minting and burning. So this approach is, is fundamentally different, and, but it's very, very simple to understand. It is an autonomous blockchain with a protocol coin baked into it. And it acts like a robot that can read the newspaper. It can go and find out what its price is at every moment on the exchange. And it can do one thing really, really well. It can adjust its money supply. 
so it can increase its money supply if the price is too high on the exchange because we need to get more money out there into the marketplace to bring that price back down and it can decrease its money supply but it decreases it not only with market forces but by burning meaning it is going to literally remove units of currency from the money supply and we think this is really really important and a very very important distinction um, because of some of the problems that you can have, especially over the longer term, with some of these other approaches. And I'm talking about the non-asset backed approaches here. So let me dive into some of those distinctions really quickly for you. Um, starting back again with the fiat backed approach, you know, I think one of the things that's great about it is it's really easy to understand. You know, hey, you mean I have behind this cryptographic token, there's a dollar back there and I can come get it later. That's easy for me to understand. Um, the other thing is it should be relatively resilient, right? It should really, really be able to track its peg of say a dollar because presumably all the money is sitting back there in the bank vault somewhere. Um, I mentioned that there's some problems though. Um, since it's centralized, the assets that are supposedly backing these cryptocurrencies could be seized. You could have a government step in and say, we don't like what you're doing. Um, you know, they could be taxed or there could be fraud or theft. And so it's just, we're back to the old problems with centralization when we take this approach. Um, you know, many people in our community think that the centralization part is the, is the, that's the fatal flaw of this fiat backed stable coin approach. I actually disagree. I think that true USD, for example, may pull this off and do it right. Um, and I also think that fiat backed cryptocurrencies are going to be with us for a very long time. I could see, for example, financial institutions requiring certain customers, if they're going to be in crypto for certain types of purposes, to be in a fiat backed crypto as opposed to a non asset backed for some kind of liability or insurance reasons or what have you. So I don't think those are going away, but I don't think they're going to be the dominant stablecoin approach because of this fatal flaw that I've listed here. There's no profit margin. Um, and Fran, who's our next speaker, brought that up with me just now before we before I came on stage. If I if I'm I can't really have a good business if I'm just taking a dollar from you and giving you a dollar, and then later you're going to give me the token back and I give you your dollar back. There's not a lot of margin there, right? Um, and that's why you see these coins like Tether or True USD being created not by entrepreneurs who are trying to make money, but rather by exchanges who rely on a stablecoin to operate as a trading pair for all the other cryptocurrencies. So they have to do this to support their regular business. On the crypto backed uh, front, you know, I think one of the things that's kind of cool about those is that you start to move towards decentralization. That's kind of neat. Um, the versions of these crypto backed stable coins that are out there to date, however, are really complicated to understand. And you don't want that. You really don't want that complication uh, for a couple reasons, not just because it gives you a headache when you read the white paper, but also because if you have a stable coin, the mechanisms need to communicate really loudly and clearly to the marketplace of traders what's going to happen in the future. So the more complicated the back end system is to try to control the stability of the coin, the harder it's going to be to send a very, very clear message to those traders so that they know what to do in pursuing their self interest in the marketplace. And if you're not communicating clearly to the traders, you're not going to have as stable of a stable coin, which is a problem. The other con is that, um, you know, many of these also have poor business models. So, you know, I, I really um, admire the MakerDAO team, um, but I think their business model is bad. I don't want to really participate in creating DAI because I don't want to tie up my ether uh, and then only extract 75% of the value of that ether and then maybe lose the ether along the way. That doesn't sound very compelling to me. Um, and so I think this is a this is a this is a problem. There's another problem, and that is that if you have crypto backing for your stablecoin, um, as we're all very very well aware, you know, cryptocurrency can go down in value precipitously, right? So, um, so if that's what's backing your coin, then the marketplace can never feel totally confident that in a month or two months or whenever 
that stablecoin is still going to have its backing and its value, and that's, that's a problem. On the senior shares front, again, this um, much, much more decentralization, I think, is a really positive thing. Um, and the senior shares models start to have good you know, revenue streams, good business models. And that is because they are not backing their stablecoin with something else necessarily, right? So if you're not doing that, that starts to push you over into the type of role that governments and in and, and the past monarchs played, where they're able to create new value, new currency, and issue that to the marketplace. So once you move on this non-asset side of the ledger, all of a sudden there's a lot of value that's created that you can use to do some really cool stuff. And I think that's something that's great about the seniority shares model. Um, boy, they're super complicated. Uh, they're really, really complicated. And again, uh, that's, that's, that's not what you want. Um, the other thing, at least in the, the, the approaches so far, have been, you know, they've sold the ownership of these networks to relatively few people. Um, so, you know, a bunch of, you know, a handful of rich guys, basically. And so uh, I think that's a missed opportunity, you know, for a more broad, broad-based ownership of the network. Um, the fatal flaw, however, in this approach is what NewBits is, is kind of seeing right now. And that is that even if you count on those market forces that I mentioned a moment ago, paying someone something akin to interest, for example, to take money out of the money supply, even if you can, even if you can kind of control in the short term the fluctuations of that stablecoin around its peg, there's an assumption. The assumption is that that bondholder, say, is going to, is going to want to be paid back in stablecoin. Because if there's a loss of confidence in the eternal growth of the market cap for that particular stablecoin, now all of a sudden, how much do you want to, how badly do you want to own those bonds? Or how badly do you want to buy more bonds? Right? So this can spiral out of control and you can have a crash. And so the senior shares model, I think, will not really be very effective until they address that particular concern. Um, you may notice this is a, a very biased presentation, right? <laughs> because I don't list a fatal flaw uh, in our column. Um, uh, but just take that with a grain of salt. Um, so I think that, that our approach is great because it's decentralized. Um, again, it also has an incredible revenue model because every time there's demand for the coin in the marketplace, this robot, this, this, um, you know, this automatic system will create new stablecoin and issue it. That new stablecoin goes to our miners. And they are then able to go on exchanges and sell that for Bitcoin or Ether or Litecoin or what have you. So that's kind of cool because you have all of this room in your business model to do really neat stuff. Like for example, drive adoption or you know, really put some value into partnerships. Um, I think one of the big cons or one of the things that we have to get past is trust, right? I think that people will need to see tokens like ours operating stably in the marketplace for some number of weeks or days or months or what have you before they start to, you know, say, okay, now I can put more of my portfolio into this type of stable coin because I've seen it weather all kinds of things. I've seen the money, the money supply expand. I've seen it contract. I've seen, you know, it take a hit. I've seen it recover from that. So I think that's one of the things that we have to do uh, when we roll out in a couple of months. I want to talk about this minting and burning in a, in a little bit greater detail so that you understand how it works. Um, this is an algorithmic level of stability mechanisms. And this illustration shows you a couple of different scenarios. So the yellow line there is, is where our KUSD coin wants to be. That's at one US dollar. But of course, we know that the demand is going to fluctuate in the marketplace. So depending on what's going on in the marketplace and what's happening with the price of the KUSD stable coin, the blockchain itself is going to do different things. Uh, the green sections, you may have noticed, are where it's above one US dollar, and the red sections are where it's below one US dollar. So let's talk about that first green section. So this would be a situation in which people want to buy this stable coin. Let's say they're worried about a decline in Bitcoin. 
right now and they say, I want to buy stable coin. I want to move into stable coin. You know, I don't care. I'll pay, I'll pay a dollar and one because I'm afraid Bitcoin is going to take, you know, a 20% hit over the next couple of days. I, I don't care. So what that is going to demonstrate is a little bit of extra demand, right? So the blockchain will go, okay, I'm getting this information in through my decentralized Oracle. Looks like I need to take some action. And it will begin to ramp up the block rewards that are being distributed to the miners who are mining, uh, mining the blockchain. That then increases the money supply. We rely on some number of those miners to turn around, sell that on exchanges, and then it starts to bring back down the price of the coin in line with one US dollar. What about that red section there though? That's the, this is the harder thing to deal with. When the price of KUSD drops below $1, a couple of things happen. One is the block rewards automatically go to zero. You don't want to be minting new money for sure. But also something else kicks in. It's something that we call a stability fee. It is a very, very small fee that is um, levied on all on-chain transactions that take place during that time. Um, in our agent-based modeling, even under some pressure, the the amount of that fee is in you know, less than 20 basis points. So something very, very, very marginal and small. It is capped at 2%. Um, to us, that sounded way low at first. Um, but what we found in our testing is that it's sufficient. It's sufficient to pull a lot of money out of the money supply in a relatively short order of time. Just to give you an idea of what it, what it can do. So with very, very conservative assumptions of 15% uh, daily turnover, of the money supply. Uh, this burn fee can remove 8% of the total money supply in 30 days or 40% in 180 days. Now, you know, that's 40%, that sounds like a lot, 180 days also sounds kind of like a lot, you know. If it really took 180 days, let's say something went really wrong and people started to lose confidence in the stable coin, it went down to 60 cents. And then I'm t what I'm here telling you is that, hey, it's okay, it will burn it will automatically burn 40% of the money supply in 180 days. Okay, but nobody wants to wait 180 days to get their stable coin back to its par value, right? So, but luckily we don't have to because what this system does is it creates transparency and predictability for all of you and thousands and even millions of others in the world who are interested in making profits. And these are self-interested traders who might see KUSD trading at 98 cents, for example, and go, hey, I know what happens. Nobody's in control of this. It's going to burn money supply until it gets back. So maybe right now I'm going to do something in the knowledge of that, what's going to happen. I think I'm going to buy as much of this stuff as I can get because I'm going to make two points on my money right now. And so this is why the communication to the marketplace is so important because it's not, the, these algorithms will, given time, they will restore the money, they will bring the supply back in line with the demand, they will. But they don't keep it glued to its peg. What does that is the self-interest of lots and lots of traders. So another way of saying this is that we have to marry the, um, you know, the, the, this elegant software and these algorithms with the self-interest of the marketplace as a whole and create an incentive system that works together using human nature and mathematics to hold stability. Um, this is another picture kind of of the same thing. I just want to point out kind of a little bit about the token economics in our model. What happens is that in these green sections here, you see that the new KUSD is created. We have something we call mining tokens. These are two different tokens. On the one hand, you have the stable coin, KUSD, and on the other hand, you have a mining token. That mining token is the proof of stake that you need to mine the stable coin. And importantly, it's done so in a way that everybody can check at any moment in time, right? It's totally transparent and open. So that is the way that the money is actually removed from the money supply. Um, maybe one quick point about the, about the blockchain, since, since I know many of you are working on your own projects. Um, in order to get all of this stuff to work, we decided about 16 months ago that we were going to have to you know, create a protocol coin. And, and so what we decided to do was to fork the Ethereum code base, but we also wanted to build a network that could support really enterprise-grade transactional throughput. 
And so our team uh, worked loosely with the team from Tendermint to take the Tendermint consensus protocol, modify it heavily to fit our requirements, and marry it with the Ethereum code base. And so what we have today uh, that's in testnet is essentially a version of Ethereum that is super fast. It, is, you know, it, it has one second block times. Um, it's looking right now like we can handle four to 11,000 transactions per second at this moment of development, and we have a clear path to get many more than that. And these are transactions that are basically free because the, there's, not, there's no proof of work. It's not really hard to do the mining on this network. So this is a, uh, a fast and uh, inexpensive version of Ethereum that will be released very, very soon that also happens to feature a stable coin. And so I just mentioned this because what's been happening after a lot of these talks is that uh, other projects have been coming up to us saying, um, you know, wow, these are the things, you know, we don't like to tell people this, but our business models actually don't work on the Ethereum blockchain right now because we can't predict our gas prices, which means we don't know what our costs are going to be. And our customers, we don't think really want to pay in a volatile cryptocurrency. And we created this utility token, but you know what? It's volatile too. So that's kind of broken. And plus we don't, we're not FX experts. You know, we don't know how to time the market for Ethereum. So we don't know if we should stock up more on, Ethereum, on Ether now, or maybe we should wait, maybe it's going to drop again. So these are, these are different complications that many projects are dealing with right now that are impeding their progress and impeding their, their go to market. So I mentioned that if you have any projects like that, or you have that situation where you need a stable coin or you need this kind of blockchain, please, please uh, you know, find me later uh, so that we can meet and talk about that. We're, we're putting together a process uh, to help folks like that. Um, there are some advantages that I've mentioned already about these non-asset backed coins and, uh, and especially our approach. Um, one of them is that you can, you can actually get a decentralized network. And that's what, you know, I think that's one of the things that really drew us all uh, to Bitcoin initially was the fact that you didn't have to have any centralized party running this thing, that it could kind of run itself. Now, the fiat-backed um, uh, tokens are still centralized, but, this, but those, uh, those types uh, from the second row over are much more decentralized. You also have a chance, as I mentioned earlier, to really get broad ownership of the networks. And that's important because, you know, for a couple of reasons. One, sort of philosophically, it seems to make sense that you want lots and lots of people owning the networks. You also get more security, of course, in blockchains when you have broad uh, ownership. Um, but it's also kind of fair, too, you know, to give people a shot at actually owning the network. When you get into an approach like ours, which is a non-asset backed stablecoin, you have the ability to create lots and lots of value. So it's nice if you can use that value to drive adoption, but also to drive the financial interest of, of many, many people across the globe. So um, yeah, so this is uh, <laughs> the, the projects on the left, basically, I think uh, are, are just for rich guys. And then and as, you move across, as you move across from left to right, you've got a little bit more uh, democratic ownership. So I'm going to not go much more so that we can have some time for questions. I do want to mention that we, um, you know, we really view ourselves as building a key piece of infrastructure that is needed for, needed for our industry as a whole. So uh, we want to partner with you if it makes sense to try to build this infrastructure and um, help everyone get to the next level where we where we do have mass adoption of cryptocurrencies so please reach out to us if um, if you think there might be a way that we can work together either on the stablecoin front or with an exchange or with your project and so on i thank you very much for your attention and the organizers for putting this together and i'd love to hear some questions from you if you're ready right we can take uh probably one question if we're a bit behind time oh I we think are so. i'm sorry okay no worries no worries uh, i think somebody raised up his hand right at the front yes yes we'll take that question i can hear you i can repeat it if you want oh here it comes here it comes um i saw that you put your currency ahead of base coin on the list and in terms of more decentralized could you yeah. tell us or compare i think it's about the ownership of the ownership of the of, of the network so um yeah so i think it's because um, do you own any base shares? I don't. 
You don't? Yeah, but it, I'm following it closely. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you're, if you if you choose to own them, um, you know you're you're not first in line. Um, there are very very few people who are first in line. So very very large VCs and large investors in the space really came up. And I mean, this is my opinion, right? I think they gobbled up a lot of the. Uh, a lot of the valuable real estate in that Basecoin universe early on, um, there are advantages to that because you get tons of money into your project, which is good, and you get lots of really great help from those big time investors. But that's why I didn't put them all the way to the right because I don't think they're going to have any room for you know regular people to own the network. Yeah, so that's more centralization is what it comes down to, right? Does it make sense? So. Okay, I'll explain it one other way. You're trying to get people to regulate your money supply, right? So if you have, uh, let's say, a, a thousand holders of bonds who are controlling the money supply for you, that's many fewer than hundreds and hundreds of thousands of traders who are acting independently. That's what I'm saying. Um, if you want to see how this can impact a stablecoin project negatively, I would suggest that you look into the recent history of new bits that also has sort of a relatively small universe of players who are responsible for controlling the stability. And you can see kind of what the dangers in this approach might be.